Right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, about crime and uses of, of open data. Um, I think I'm going to start with the main message here, right, since this group is, is, is interested in transportation and, and mobility. It's, it's the fact that what we're actually trying to actually do here, uh, so this is basically the take-home message from the beginning, is to actually create signatures for cities. Right? So we're trying to create crime signatures with the purpose of actually doing better city planning. So as you see, what we're trying to find are regularities in how crime takes place in urban environments. And with that, we can say that city A is very similar to city B in relation to the dynamics and the concentration of crime. All right, so the papers we published, uh, they have mo more to do to show first that crime concentrates independent of population size. And then there is a second paper that I'm not going to talk about. I just put a reference in the end that has to do with how uh, the crime actually flows across the city. But the purpose is to create those signatures. So I think we can also do the same thing in terms of, uh, of transportation signatures so that we can actually say, okay, how, what's the traffic in London, how similar it is to other, to other locations. All right, so I'm going to try to actually fly through this because I have 15 minutes. So there are many different types of crime. And we talked, actually touched about uh, um, the issue of standardization of uh, those data sets. And when we do a study on crime, one of the problems is that people don't call the same crime with the same name in different locations in the world. Right? So this is why when we look at open data sets, sometimes we find uh, crimes about, let's say, something, some people call something theft and is actually robbery, as we see here. So we try to actually, there is a lot of data uh, processing and kind of massaging to actually come up with uh, a consistent classification. So and we concentrate on three because those three we can find in many areas in many cities in the world. Right? So and those three are theft, robbery, and, and, and burglary. And the way it classified is basically theft is something like that. So it's quite amusing to actually look at this from YouTube. So, um, so somebody trying to, uh, to take some, I think, a wig from a store. Uh, generally, there's no violence involved, although there is some sort of confrontation there, right? So you have um, burglary, where there is no violence. Somebody just breaks into your house. And then you have robbery there. That's generally there's guns involved, OK? The other reason to do this is because crime is everywhere, right? So, I mean, this is just pictures of heat maps of crime in different cities in the world, right? So the bottom right is actually thefts of, uh, of bicycles in London, for instance. Um, the, I also decided, since we were working on human mobility, we decided to go back to crime because I did some work a long time ago in crime where we actually tried to create a model that could predict where crime would take place, but this was crime against property, right? So nothing is moved. So it's basically uh, the currency is a pharmacy, a bank, and something like that. Okay. So skipping that as well. So why now using uh, uh, urban data? Because people are living in cities, right? So you can see here that since 2005, we have this trend of more people in cities, and they actually the number of people living in the rural areas actually remain quite constant. Uh, in addition to this, we actually have this uh, pervasive uh, uh, collection of data sets. So what you see here is actually inferring mobility, for instance, from Twitter. Unfortunately, now uh, our colleague here was saying that there is no more geotag, but we can actually infer for dense cities like New York where how people are moving. Okay. So another reason to look at crime is because crime has a structure. This is, an, again, an old paper that we, can, we could show that if we do a simple modeling on crime and relations between crime events, uh, based on proximity, something that is incredibly naive, right? So basically take two, several events, uh, and then we link them based on some radius. Um, we can actually, and I'm trying to go fast here, we can create a network, and this network wins once you do some sort of stochastic block model division of that. Uh, it correlates, so those borders correlate with uh, socioeconomic factors, which basically means that uh, what we say is that People, the crimes taking place in one location or the individuals taking, uh, or committing crime in one, in one location, they tend not to commit crimes uh, in another location. All right, so, but we, we want to look at scaling, as I said, scaling and dynamics, right? So scaling, concentration, and dynamics. So there's a seminal work from Bittencourt that says that uh, there are a lot of urban indicators that uh, scale with population. So we wanted to see if crime actually, uh, co the concentration of crime also grows with the population. Generally, Bittencourt argues that there are two, sub sub two, uh, two categories, right? So infrastructure grows super linearly with the population size, and social aspects like creation of patents, for instance, uh, grows super linearly. So we wanted to see what crime is. So I'm, I try to remind you that I'm not looking at uh, 
how the, n the number of crime, but it's how it concentrates. So we know, so I'm going to try to skip this, we know for a long time that crime does concentrate, right? There are regions, so there are 20%, let's say that 2080, that 20% of the regions have more crime, so, but we want to characterize that to have that signature. So what we do is basically um, try to get rid of the aggregation problem. If we want to eliminate population as part of the mix, we need to divide a city based on the data that exists in regions that have more or less the same population size. Right? So, so we, we had to come up with a way to do that, and this is really does, does, doesn't, um, I mean, it's not interesting to this group, but we can, we can divide our cities in several uh, cells, and then those uh, do a Voronoi tessellation, create a network, and then divide that network in any way we want in any sub-regions with this fixed population size. Once we do that, then we can look at how, how many events actually took place in each of those cells. Right? Uh, this is just a slide about where the data come from. So we did mostly data uh, cities in the US and the UK. Um, and then the characteristics that we use in terms of concentration is using the Lorentz curve, which basically says that if it grows linearly with population size, it will be on this line. So the steeper is the curve, the more concentrated the crime actually is. So we did this, we took one city, uh, that's what how, how we, we did first, we took Chicago, and then we look at the three types of crime, theft, robbery, and burglary, and we notice that there is a difference between each of them. So that theft concentrates more than robbery, that concentrates more than burglary. Well, this is one city, so we went on and said, okay, let's do for every city that we have. So this is the same picture there, and when I color code, you can see that we can uh, clearly show that there is a signature for theft, burglary, and, and robbery that are different from each other, right? Uh, and uh, we can also look at the probability of the, a particular location having an event and then have this exponent characterize that. So I'm sorry, I'm rushing. Uh, then if we put this as some sort of kind of density estimation of that exponent, you can see that consistently we see that this exponent for theft is over here. The, for, for robberies over there, and it's less organized for robbery. So there is a clear concentration on theft, the concentration of robbery is not so much. But the point is that with that, we start basically saying, start seeing similarities, right? We can say, for instance, San Francisco is more or less, let's say, similar, so I will just pick one here, uh, similar perhaps to Seattle. So which means, from the point of view of policy making, is that if, if, I ha if something worked to reduce crime in San Francisco, I, and I'm the mayor of Seattle, I can probably use that policy as well, right? Rather than just blindly say, well, I want to reduce crime in London, and say, well, something worked in Manchester. Well, you don't know if the, the way crime concentrates in, uh, in London is the same as Manchester. Um, getting to the final, so this is just to show that it is independent of population. You can see here, this is the, uh, the exponent that characterizes the concentration for different cities, and this is the population, and you can see that we can do a, an independence test, and those, those two curves are independent. Last dynamics, right, which I think is actually, in my opinion, uh, uh, better. So one, one thing is to say, uh, more interesting, one thing is to say that there are, uh, that the city is concentrated independent of the population size. And the consequence of that, just think of, I'm saying that city like my, my city, Exeter, the crime in Exeter concentrates exactly in the same way, right, as New York. So New York is mostly a bunch of Exeters put together. So, but that is one thing. I'm saying there, are, there is always a region that you have a lot of crime, but I haven't told you if that region changed. So, and that's the dynamics, right? So if I take the highest or the most dangerous location in a particular city, so will that be constant? So if I look uh, uh, basically longitudinally, will that location always be the most dangerous? So, and this is what we do, we take basically, and this diagram is some, could be difficult to understand, but think of it of the rank of the concentration, right? This is where I have the most number of, of crime events, second, third, and so on over time, and what I do is to basically say, I'm trying to look at the rank stability of this location. So if I take the number one location in a city, how much does it change? And we use entropy for that, right? So we're basically saying, uh, if the entropy here is high, it means that the location is always, the location that's the most dangerous is always changing, right? If it is low, then it means that the location is more constant. So uh, this is what the diagram does. 
And I'm going to jump to this slide, which basically says that that is the signature of the dynamics. And as you can see here, we take a city, for instance, Portland, and we basically saying that the number one location, the most dangerous location, tends to be quite constant. It's always that one. And if I take a city, for instance, like Kansas City, the most dangerous location changes much more often. And we can see that it becomes quite disorganized as we go up the ranks. So basically saying, if with, with the exception of the first, second, and third locations, then it's quite difficult to predict what is the fourth most dangerous location in that city. And we, we also show that this signature exists for different types of crime. And the point is, we can have signatures for, of crime, not only of the concentration, which is what I showed before, but also how it moves. On the paper that I'm not going to present here, I'm going to go to my conclusions, we actually show that the, the way crime moves, so here I'm just showing that it does move, right? and the way crime moves is actually predictable as well. And so we have a paper we'll have in, on this slide, it's called the traveling waves of crime, where we can say that there is a neighboring effect. So if you reduce crime in a particular location, it tends to flow to the neighboring ones right? in a, in a predictable way. So. Uh, Take home messages here is basically there is some predictability in crime at the aggregate level, right? So we do need to actually take this in consideration when and create real-time models, do policing that actually understands this factor, right? And those signatures perhaps can be used to, uh, to uh, the way we find the signatures could be used to find signatures in other urban indicators. Next, what we want to do, we're working in this Okay, so how does crime, the mobility of crime, relates to the human mobility and relates to the actual urban mobility, right? So I'm saying this is how people move, but how cars move and how the roads are laid out and so on, which is basically uh, written here, crime and the structure of cities, right? So there are cities that are radial, there are cities that are more lattice-like, so could we actually demonstrate that the predictability is actually linked to how the cities are actually planned? So maybe a city planner could actually change the way uh, the cars uh, 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 flow in the city with the intent or secondary intent to actually reducing crime. Right? And we're now trying to work with the Department of Defense to see uh, if this predictability that we see on how people move and how crime takes place can help us actually identify uh, interesting events inside rail stations and airports and so on. Right? Again, so I'll, I'll finish here. So those are the two papers. If, uh, if you're interested in this kind of, of work, uh, come and talk to me. Uh, generally, we're looking for signatures. Right? Thank you.